Thank you, Baxter, I think. And good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Lee. I'm an alcoholic. You know, that's a true story. I'm driving down the road about four or five years ago. I see one of those signs he's talking about. And you know the churches that always have the, the neat little sands out front. And this one said, if you're looking for a sign from God, this is it. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, I said, all right, I can go with that, you know. And uh, 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 Abby, thank you for what you read. You know, that's one of my uh, uh, favorite chapters of the book. It is uh, uh, truly after a number of years uh, uh, of, of searching uh, high and low and, and uh, 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 near and far that, uh, that I found a conception of God that I can grab hold of and utilize in my life today through, through the very simple directions that I found in that chapter. And other people may find it different places, and I think that's what you read. That's one of the great things about Alcoholics Anonymous is that you let me show up exactly as I was, and it gave me a chance to become what I am today. And as my wife and daughter said, you know, we were sitting around one, one night at the dinner table uh, uh, 10 or 11 years ago, maybe longer, and I said, you know, God and AA have really changed my life. And, and I was being serious, and they both said, well, I hope they're not done. And I, uh, 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 and I hope you're not done, too. I really do. And I, I think that's part of the message that I heard from Bob last night in the last 15 or 20 minutes of that meeting. You know, I, I, I hear people say all the time, and, and, and I can't speak for anyone else's experience, but they say, you know, I've never left an AA meeting that I didn't feel better for having been there. And I'm going to tell you, I've been to a lot of AA meetings. I felt a lot worse for having been there. Because at a really good meeting, I'm going to hear something about me I wasn't ready to hear yet. You know, I'm going to discover something about me that might require something of me that, uh, that, I, that I've been a little nervous about it. And I was challenged by that talk last night to, to, try, to, to try to see where am I right now. You know, the easiest thing that I do is uh, go someplace and tell somebody what I used to be like with the inference being that I'm better now, you know? <laughs> and then what happened, but the hardest thing I do is talk about what I'm like today. And it's the hardest thing for me to see clearly is what I'm like today, you know? My wife Connie's not here with me today, so odds are I'll go on and on and on about what I'm like today. But uh, <laughs> uh, I said, one time she said, she said, Steve, you know that last 15 minutes of your talk? She said, bring that guy home with you sometime. I'd like to meet him. <laughs> and, uh, 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 so I, you know, you know Connie is a, uh, 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 she's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, too. We've been married for 23 years, and we've been sober for 17 of them. And her, her sobriety date is 10 days after mine. And I tell people it's a real important 10 days to me. And, uh, 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 anytime we have a little disagreement or argument or something, you know, I'll say, just wait 10 days, baby, talk will come clear to you. And, uh, uh, and uh, she said, oh, it just makes me so mad when you say that. I said, I know, but in 10 days it won't. And uh, 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 she... She doesn't buy into that, and she, she passed me a long time ago. I'll be honest with you, I hope that I can be the person that she is someday. You know, I called her yesterday, and I'm going to tell you in a few minutes about my last drink. And my last drink was, no, in fact, that's exactly when I'm going to lose credibility. You know, you come here for identification, <laughs> and that's right where I, where I might lose you, right there on my last drink. But it, we went out with, uh, 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 with four couples, uh, myself and she and I and three other couples, and it's because I was... Uh, scheduled into a treatment facility on July the 1st of 1989. And uh, 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 the three other couples that went with us, this was June the 29th of 1989, and we were having like a go away, you know, soiree before, <laughs> before I went to this treatment uh, facility, not because I had any intention of stopping drinking or anything, and I'll get into that in a minute, but uh, three Three couples, good friends of ours, and, and uh, a couple of months ago, one of the ladies uh, uh, that was with us, she called our house, and, and she was asking for some help. And uh, Friday night, she spent the night at our house. She'd been sober for a while, but, you know, she just hadn't figured out how to stay sober on Friday. And Connie said, well, come on over and stay with me. I, I think I got a good shot at it tonight. And uh, uh, so they spent a the weekend together. And see, that's, you know, that, that's what we're all about here. There's no big deals, but just one alcoholic working with another. You know, that's just a privilege to me that she would think to call us. We don't spend much time.
time together with them anymore. And it's not because we changed playmates and played things. You know what I mean? It's not. It's because that our life just kind of moved in different directions. It wasn't some divorce where I told these people I can't hang out with you anymore because you're not my kind of folks. It just naturally we moved in different directions, you know? If you go to the opera, odds are you're not going to see me there, you know, because I don't care about the opera. <laughs> So it's not, it's not a judgment, it's just we, we headed different directions, and that's what happened with us and some of our friends, but she felt comfortable calling. We were glad about that. Uh, I want to clear up a couple of things before I start, and uh, uh, this, ha this has been a wonderful weekend, it really has, and, and from, from, you know, Debbie to, to Kent to Vinoy to Tim to Bob, you, you, you have, you know, if, if you came here looking for something and don't have it yet, don't expect anything this morning, all right? <laughs> uh, uh, but the, the heavy lifting has been done. And uh, uh, the good news for me is it is just really too late for even me to screw this thing up. And, uh, uh, the other thing I want to clear up is somebody said this morning, well, Steve, you're the, you're the spiritual speaker. Well, you know, this might be the spiritual slot. All right? But uh, 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 the fact is, though, it, it's what I've come to believe is that, it, is that if I or any of us are talking about our recovery in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in the steps, and it cannot help but be a spiritual conversation. But, uh, uh, but I don't feel any particular enlightenment in that area. But our 12 steps are spiritual in their nature, so if some of my discussion uh, centers around them, then, then I guess uh, that qualifies. Uh, my sponsor would want you to know that uh, I'm not confused by the fact that you need to hear what I have to say today, but uh, I'm just one of those guys has a, you know, a need to say it. So I'm glad you gave me a spot to come to. My home group, uh, which is the backroom group in Nashville, Tennessee, is uh, meeting right now, 10.30 uh, uh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings, and at 9 a.m. we have a literature study. Uh, they are glad I am here today. It gives somebody else a chance to say something. Uh, 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 but I'm a grateful, uh, active member of that home group. I was talking last night with some folks at dinner, but as my weekend travel has increased a little bit, my attendance at that meeting has decreased some, so I'm really having to consider whether, whether I'm being of service to that group. I know they are being of service to me, but am I able to commit to them what I believe is appropriate to commit to a home group? And, and that's something that, I, that I'm giving a look uh, uh, as we go forward. Uh, the other thing is somebody asked me if I was nervous, and the fact is I'm, I'm really not too nervous, and I'll tell you why. They're, they're, it's because, uh, uh, you know, I, I went, uh, I was getting ready to go speak to a meeting, a little speaker meeting at a uh, group when I was about two or three years sober, and, and when I finished up, it just felt awful. I just stumbled and bumbled my way all the way through it, and, and uh, so self-conscious and everything, and I'm driving home, and I uh, called my sponsor when I got home, and I said, Joe, I said, uh, I said, I really don't think I did a very good job tonight. And he said, well, Steve, he said, you start from a false premise. He says, because that implies there's a night you think you did do a good job. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and he said, the fact is that, that, that it is not up to you to do a good job or a bad job. He says, you were invited. He said, your opportunity, your privilege is to go do what you were invited to do. And uh, you're not to stand in judgment of that one way or the other. You just do the best you can. And he said, often the speaker meeting is for the speaker and that you guys just offer that uh, 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 platform for me to do this so I might say something even I need to hear. And uh, uh, from that I can move on. Uh, the other thing is speaking before a crowd. I, the next time I spoke before, it was about 200 people. There was a speaker meeting there in Richmond and the, the, kind of the big one that they had there. And I said, Joe, I'm really nervous given the size of this crowd. He said, Steve, don't worry about that, buddy. He said, by the time you're done, it'll be down to the size you're used to. <laughs> could happen here too I know that so so please at least 30 of you stay till the end and I'll be okay uh, I told you that uh, uh, you know June the 29th of 1989 was the last drink I had June 30th and that drink like I said I'm gonna lose credibility here but uh, particularly in Texas I've had you know I've had the privilege to talk in Texas a few times but uh, you know my last drink was an amaret on the rocks <laughs> Well, I'm properly embarrassed by it, and, uh, uh, but what I hope now that, that you can clearly see is that I did not know that was going to be my last drink when I took it. Uh, I, I absolutely would not have gone down that way, you know, and, 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 
I would have given much more thoughtful consideration to what this last drink will be. But, uh, but the fact is, as I said, I was going into a treatment facility on July the 1st. Uh, uh, I was uh, going there because I'd been convicted of my six DUI. I had gone through the legal process there. They had uh, given me some jail time with that, some, uh, uh, the opportunity to either do 60 days in jail or do 10 weekends and go to uh, uh, treatment as, as some condition of my probation. And I opted for, uh, uh, for the latter. It still seemed terribly uh, uh, unfair and unjust to me, but that's, you know, just mathematically, it was better. 28 uh, days in treatment and 10 weekends was 48, even by my math, and it was 60 days in jail. So that's, that's how I made that choice. But it wasn't because I had any intention of stopping drinking. It wasn't because I thought I needed some, you know, moral uplift in my life. It wasn't because I'd had some epiphany and any great change. It was just to fulfill my obligation to the legal system of Williamson County, Tennessee. On June the 30th, my wife and I spent that day with uh, my then five-year-old daughter, Abby, uh, uh, before Daddy's going away on this 28-day business trip. And, uh, 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 <laughs> And I stop here. We we went to we went to Chuck E. Cheese, uh, 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 and and I, I often stop and make a public service announcement here. If you if you have not stopped drinking yet, uh, don't spend your first day sober at Chuck E. Cheese. Okay? <laughs> uh, uh. Some of you know what I mean, but but it, it's really loud in there, and. Uh, uh, uh. So that's how we spent that day, and, and the next morning, a, a friend of mine, uh, one, of, one of the other men that had been part of those three couples that went out that night came by and picked me up, and, and he was driving me off to a treatment facility uh, there in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is, which is where I live now. Brentwood's just a, a southern suburb of Nashville. And uh, um, uh, he was asking me on the way over there, he said, what do you think this thing's going to be like? And I said, you know, I, I don't have any idea. I don't have a clue, and I really didn't. I didn't have a clue about alcoholism. I didn't have a clue about Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't have a clue about drug and alcohol rehabilitation, which is where I was headed. I didn't have a clue about any of it. I did tell him, though, as we were driving, I'd seen, you know, maybe a, a bad TV movie of the week or something, and uh, uh, I said, you know, I'm not going to get in some little circle and go, I'm Steve, I'm an alcoholic, and tell everybody that, you know, the most intimate details of my life. And but you know, about three weeks later, I was telling people more than they wanted to know about me. <laughs> and I don't know about you folks, but you know, I'm such an average. How I get here, I don't have a clue. Cause you know, there is no great drama to my drunkalogue, and there's not great drama to, to to my you know sober story. The 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 experience of my recovery is from the inside out. You know, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it sounds like. I don't know if if. If those people who, you know, if you think I'm better than I used to be, it's great to be here because you don't know what I used to be, but, uh, uh, but, you know, none of that. What I know is the experience of my life has changed dramatically. It's, and internally is where most of the loss and most of the damage was. There were certainly, I hurt a lot of people, no question, and I did some things that, uh, that, that I, I certainly caused damage with, but, but mostly I lost myself. And so how, how I get here, I don't quite know. But, uh, uh, when I ended up, you know, early in AA, guys like me will minimize and minimize and minimize for years. My drinking, its impact on others, its impact on me. No, I don't think I have a problem. And then a weekend AA, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I did 10 years in prison. And uh, uh, I, I want to get some AA street cred right away, you know. And I started dressing down and my language got worse. And uh, uh, I wanted to be a tough guy in AA, you know, and, and, which is just something I couldn't pull off, you know, under any circumstances. But because I'm not. But that's the first flip that happened to me. I began to exaggerate. What I know today is that, and, and, and I'm going to promise you, I'm going I'm to tell the truth today. I'm going to be honest today. I might be wrong in my facts, however. Because <laughs> the way I remember things is not always how they happen. But I'm going to tell you honestly what it was like for me. Um, I got out and, uh, and walked into that treatment facility that day, and, uh, uh, and, and they gave me an assessment. Some of you have, uh, have had, had that assessment or some version of it or taken a quiz in the magazine or, or the, even our own, uh, 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 you know, we, we have our own AA pamphlet with the questions. And they were trying to assess, I believe, whether I was alcoholic, and if so, my level of alcoholism. And, you know, some people say that you're either alcoholic or you're not just like you're either pregnant or you're not. 
But the thing I, and I, I used to think about that a lot, and, and I've, I've, what I've realized is that, is that you know often, and, and I know I'm, I'm on the shaky ground with so many of you ladies here thinking that I know what it's like to be pregnant, but <laughs> you know, you, sometimes you're pregnant a little while before you know it. And then, after you know it, you're not quite ready to let other people know it, and you can walk around sometimes for two or three months without other people knowing you're pregnant. Then, it will begin to show. <laughs> and, uh, uh, when I got here, I was showing. And, uh, 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 but they were asking questions, and, and, uh, and I didn't want to be alcoholic, so I want badly to answer these questions in such a way that, that, that I will not be, you know, that, that they will not consider me alcoholic. And it was, you know, the question, there were 30 of them on this particular test, and, they, and, and I, I have my, you know, my, my file from treatment, so I glance at this every once and again to remind myself. It says, have you ever had a problem with drinking? Have you ever had a DUI? Have you ever had a blackout? Have you ever had a problem at home? Have you ever had a problem at work? You know, all of these, have you, have you ever drank in the morning? All these have you ever questions, which she said, Steve, by the way, means even once, and even with a really good reason. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and then the, there's just the, the little place to answer, check yes or check no, to what are obviously essay questions. <laughs> and, uh, 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 because you know what I mean, because they, they really do require some explanation, don't they? And, 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 it, and, it, and, and it, you know, I'm kidding about it now, but then it is so hard it was to, to make myself go check this box to, to check yes to drink in the morning. Well, what do you think that means? Do you think that means that I've been, you know, waking up and, and, and just trying to fight down that first drink? That, no, no, but do you mean that I have a drink at, you know, Bloody Mary at 1030 on Saturday to watch the football game? I mean, and you're going to put me and him in the same category, you know? <laughs> We're going to room together or something here? Uh, I mean, and, and I, my mind is just fighting, you know, it, it, the have you ever drank in the morning is maybe to me the toughest one. Because, I mean, how fine a line do we cut on that, really? It's, uh, uh, because does that mean 12.01 a.m.? Is that the morning? Uh, so these are tough. I will tell you what, what some, some men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous helped me see right away uh, uh, as we went out to meetings of AA uh, from, and at the uh, treatment facility and as men came into the facility as well, is that how I answered those questions is not what made me an alcoholic. <laughs> that how I answered those questions is perhaps exposed my alcoholism. Might have been evidence of my alcoholism, but it's not what <clears throat> makes me alcoholic. I think Anthony read what I grabbed hold of that made me an alcoholic. When I saw in the uh, uh, chapter We Agnostics where it said that if when drinking, you know, that, that, that if when drinking you can't stop entirely or if when you drink you, you can't control the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. Those two things. I had no wiggle room there, you know. I really didn't. Because entirely means stop and never start again. I thought I could stop entirely on a Tuesday and then change my mind about stopping and on Wednesday take a drink and it felt like I was making a decision. It felt like I had thought back through it and was changing my mind, but that wasn't the case for me. And then when drinking, can you control the amount you take? That was so hard for me because there were times that I had the illusion of control. There are times that I drank just the amount I meant to drink, or more, more appropriately, that I got home when I said I would be home. It was often my drinking was about time, you know? If I show up, did I get there? Did I make it? Did I, and, and you know, so sometimes I would uh, stop by and have a few drinks with guys and, uh, uh, and say, hey, I, I gotta go, you know, that, that they're waiting on me at home, or I've gotta go to work, or there's some obligation, some responsibility that, uh, that I got up and walked away from to go meet that responsibility. And then the next time, as fully committed to my intention to meet that obligation or responsibility, I could not do it. So I'm unpredictable. And I think I'm the guy that left rather than the guy that had no power. You know, my wife and I, every now and then, we would go to uh, Pizza Hut and, and get a pitcher of beer with our young daughter at the time, eat a pizza. You look around the Pizza Hut, right? 
there's the softball team over there and there's some families in there and there's the cheerleading squad and this is a Norman Rockwell painting. This all looks good. There can't be anything wrong with this. This looks fine. Now, later, you know, I'm out, uh, I'm, I'm at the, you know, Ramada Inn dancing with somebody who's not my wife, uh, 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 <laughs> crashing my car, in, you know, into a tree, getting arrested and, and in, the, uh, in the drunk tank and being bailed out the next day. And I think I'm the guy at Pizza Hut. I keep thinking I'm the guy at Pizza Hut, but I'm not. I'm not. It took me a long time to see that. Uh, I told you about my last drink. I got it. You know, I tell people sometimes my story is sort of like a Quentin Tarantino movie. You know, I, uh, there's just no time and space continuum in it. And, uh, uh, what I hope is that as I tell a whole series of seemingly unrelated events, they will <laughs> somehow meld together in the end. To, make some sort of cohesive statement, but, uh, 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 but when I think of something, I got to tell you then, because it's gone right after it, right? So, uh, and I thought, forgot already what I was going to tell you a second ago. <laughs> so I'll go back to my first drink, which is just about, you know, uh, equally uh, 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 embarrassing as my last drink, and uh, uh, I didn't, I'm from Smyrna, Tennessee, it's where I was born and raised, it's a small town just out of Nashville, 20 or 30 miles. 5,000 people about lived there when I grew up. It was a service town, though my family wasn't in the service. It was an Air Force town. My family wasn't in the Air Force. I got a, you know, my mother and my father. I got an older sister and an older brother and a younger sister. I got to tell you, middle class family, nothing particularly difficult about growing up where I grew up, nothing particularly tough about growing up in the family in which I grew up. There were no circumstances that, uh, that led to me being an alcoholic. I know some people have very difficult circumstances and they may play a role in the need to relieve certain pain earlier and, and turn to alcohol for that. And, and, but, but for me, that wasn't the case. There wasn't an external reason. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was a pretty good kid. No, you know, I, I really, I say I was a good kid. I was, uh, I was compliant, you know. I was compliant because I, what I didn't want was to get in trouble. Uh, uh, but it actually was pretty easy for me when Anthony read that, that, that for many of us, you know, that, that if a mere code of morals or philosophy of living were sufficient, that many of us would have recovered long ago. I will tell you that, that my code of morals and philosophy of living were sufficient, you know, right up to the moment they were no longer sufficient. And I don't know exactly when that happened, but I had a code of morals and a philosophy, and there were things that I was not going to do, and for a long time I did not do them. And when I went out, I, I went where I said I was going to go. I was with who I said I was going to be with. I came home when I said I was going to be home. And, uh, uh, and sometimes I wasn't happy about that. Sometimes I was acting good but feeling bad, uh, feeling, you know, yearning for more. But, but I was compliant. When I was about, I didn't drink. I played a lot of sports. I was hanging around with people. I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't a guy that, that, uh, that didn't have a lot of friends. I was very social and... and, and uh, a lot of people were, were, you know, drinking and using drugs, and I was hanging out with them, and that wasn't a problem up until the day it was a problem. And uh, uh, two buddies of mine came by, and we were going back to, I was a freshman in college at Middle Tennessee State University in, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're driving back to a basketball game at my high school. So first clue of immaturity, you know, we're going back to high school. To, these are the girls we're going to impress as the sophomores in high school. And, uh, uh, <laughs> And, and, I, and I have to report that we didn't impress them much either that particular evening. But they come by and get me and they hand back a bottle of Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine. And, uh, you know, that really bothers me when you do that. Cause, uh, <laughs> it does because uh, uh, I've been around long enough to know that a lot of people my age got a, got a good start on that Boone's Farm. And, uh, and, and don't act like you're too good for it now, okay? <laughs> But uh, uh, they pass that around. You know, I started sweet and I ended sweet down that deal. And, and uh, uh, I had a one old boy tell me one time, he said, Steve, I wouldn't have put that on my pancakes, you know. And, uh, 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 but it's because, see, I didn't like the taste of liquor. And it's not required. But I didn't like the taste of liquor. But, uh, uh, but this was sweet enough. I liked it okay. They passed it around. It went around a few times. Other people this weekend have, have explained a little bit about the experience that they had when, when alcohol really lit that fire, when it did something. that when, when it provided what was missing when I, was, when I had no clue what was missing. 
And, and what happened with me, I was in the back seat of, of a 1968, 65 Volkswagen Bug somewhere back in there. And, and uh, uh, this was 1971. And uh, uh, about the third or fourth time that thing came around, I couldn't wait to get where we were going. Because I thought they couldn't wait to see me when I got there. <laughs> you know, and it's the first time I'd had that feeling that, man, and, uh, you know, that, that back seat of that Volkswagen would not hold me now. I could not wait to get out and spring myself on an unsuspecting world and to, and to finally take this thing. And, and it, you know, it just felt great. And I know everybody's had some, you know, whatever your experience was, everybody had something. But it did, you know, I, I don't know where I'm different than the non-alcoholic in, in, in the way I feel. I mean, I believe that there are, fe that there are feelings that are common to the alcoholic but that might be common to a lot of other people as well. I, I just really don't know, but what I do know is that it seems like the effect of alcohol on me treats those feelings differently and in a more extreme fashion than it does the non-alcoholic. It does something for me on those feelings that alcohol doesn't seem to do to the non-alcoholic. The book says what most normal people get from a few drinks, and, and it, you know, it says conviviality which I had, you know, I thought I'd been arrested for solicitation of that a couple of times, but what it, <laughs> I didn't know what that was. What it turns out is that conviviality, among other things, means feasting and drinking. It says it means joyous intimacy with friends. You know, freedom from care, worry, and boredom. Colorful imagination. And a feeling that life is good. I get thirsty saying it. <laughs> but who, who wouldn't want that? Who, who wouldn't be attracted to that, a feeling that life is good? And I think maybe that's the feeling I was having that night in the backseat of that Volkswagen. It's going to be okay. This is all right. I can deal with whatever comes down the pipe now. And uh, our book goes on to say that, that that that's not so for a guy like me. Once I got here showing, that's not what alcohol was doing for me. It says maybe momentarily. So, but then comes oblivion and the awakening with the you know, hideous four horsemen of terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. So how many times did I leave the house or did I take a drink or did I do something else with the hopes of finding joyous intimacy with friends, colorful imagination, conviviality? And that feeling that life is good, and wake up with those four bedfellows of terror, you know, look around to see these guys in the morning. That's, you know, this was ugly. See, and, and that happened to me time and time again. That's not what I was shooting for. You know, my sponsor says the last 15 or 20 years of his drink, and he thinks he just kept getting bad whiskey, you know, because <laughs> he wanted the whiskey that had that package in it. But I kept getting that terror, bewilderment, frustration, and, uh, and despair package. And, uh, 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 so I get to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and when I got here and, and after a while in that treatment facility, I knew that I needed to stop drinking. I wasn't yet sure if I wanted to stop drinking, but I knew I needed to. And I was prepared for the fact that I will get, make every effort not to drink anymore, but I don't know what life is going to look like or feel like doing that. I said, I thought I'd be spending most of my time not drinking. You know, when somebody would call, Steve, we're going to go play golf today. You want to go? Now, you know, I'd love to, but I'll be home not drinking today. <laughs> and, uh, 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 we're going to go to football game Saturday. You want to go with us? No, no, Saturday. I'm actually not drinking all day long on Saturday. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and just this, this vision of just holding on and, 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 and constantly feeling like I'm having to sacrifice and give up something and not be able to do something, but I just shouldn't. And that's what not drinking was going to feel like. And that has just absolutely not been the case in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so grateful. And the book in that part, just to finish you know, where I started, goes on to say that to me, that when, you, when, when I ask you, what's this life going to be like, you've got to substitute. AA says yes, and it's vastly more than that. You gave me vastly more than I thought I was giving up. It says, and A, you'll find a fellowship where you'll find release from care, boredom, and worry. The same things over there. Your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most meaningful years of your existence lie ahead. That's almost the flip side of what we read before. 
you know, colorful imagination and my imagination being fired of the same thing. That fellowship is joyous intimacy with friends. I, I've had joyous intimacy with friends this weekend. Thank you for that. The most meaningful years of my existence lie ahead. Alcoholics Anonymous has given my life meaning where it was meaningless. That morning I went to that treatment facility, another question uh, that was not a yes or no question. This was an essay question, but it also seems like they knew me because the question was, what is your purpose in life? And there was a line about that long. <laughs> and at first I was offended at the brevity of space, you know, and I realized that I had nothing to put in that space. And I didn't know I didn't have anything to put in it because I would, that's never a question I would ask myself. What is my purpose? Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a purpose. To stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety when I can't think of anything better. You know, sometimes I wake up with a better idea, but uh, <laughs> I'm encouraged to call my sponsor anytime I just got a really good idea. I should call. Uh, but it really has, you know. To call home and hear that, 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 that our friend Judy is staying at our house. See, that gives life purpose. To get a phone call, as I did uh, yesterday, from a, from a young man that I had no answer for. Just some conversation. You know, was, and this was a guy who had been sober for a while, and you know what? His question was about his conduct. He was trying to be a better man. And he was asking me some advice about how to do that. Now, who would ever thought, you know, seen that coming? Steve, what do you think about this? See, what a privilege that is. That somebody, not, not to have to have the answer, but that you include me in your life. It's, it's, it's not, it's not teacher-student so much as being included. To be able to participate in each other's lives. To share with one another. And uh, uh, so my life has meaning today. It's been given meaning by the many women in Alcoholics Anonymous and those people that, that aren't here but that are sometimes trying to be. Uh, I started drinking. I, you know, I don't know if I, I got, I got drunk that first night, and, and I had a blackout that first night. I was a blackout drinker. I blackout, you know, just about every time. And In fact, that was really my criteria for determining whether I was drunk or not if I blacked out, because I really thought almost everybody did. And if I remembered what happened, I thought that was a pretty good night, you know, even if what I remembered wasn't particularly good. And, uh, uh, but I don't know if I was alcoholic from that moment on. I, I, I don't have a clue. I got, I got an opinion, but I'm, you know, you're encouraged, you know, I'm encouraged not to share them, and you're encouraged not to pay any attention to them most of the time. But it was, uh, 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 I don't know if I drank alcoholically from that moment on, because I drank enthusiastically from that moment on. <laughs> I drank at every opportunity from that moment on. I couldn't wait to feel that way again. You know, our book says that, that the guys who wrote it, uh, you know, they say that, that they believe, though they can't prove it, it says they believe that many of them could have stopped early on in their drink. And I figured out, just like me, the reason they can't prove it is because none of them ever tried. <laughs> <laughs> because why would I stop something that's doing something so magical for me, even though immediately there was a price to pay for my drinking? Immediately, there were, there were consequences of wrecked cars and DUIs and, 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 and behavioral outbreaks that, uh, 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 that, that disappointed other people. But still, what I was getting was so, so you know, it did so much for me that, that, that I'm willing to risk this. I wouldn't think about not trying this again. I wouldn't think about not trying it again. So I began to drink like that, and I drank uh, uh, aggressively. And uh, as I said, immediately began to have uh, some of those uh, uh, external circumstances that come with it. And I, I wrecked a few cars and I, you know, uh, I totaled six automobiles along with those six DUIs that I got. And, and you know, I, I'm going to tell a couple of quick, you know, driving drunk stories. And, and, and before I do that, I want to make sure that you know something. You know, I'm so grateful that I never hurt anybody badly. And I don't... You, you can't have a gathering of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon like this that, uh, that somebody here's life hasn't been directly impacted by a drunk driver. So I don't want you to think for a moment that I, that I make light of, uh, of what I did. 
But the fact is, given a little time and perspective and circumstance, and since someone wasn't badly hurt, some of these, what, what I see looking back at my alcoholism, which is about the only way I can see it is looking back at it, is the absurdity of it. The absurdity that I was unable to see at the time. So I, I go out, I moved down to, uh, when I was 23, I, I, I kind of ran away from home. I'd been working with my brother, who was, who was my boss, and my mom, and, and I still work in that family business today. But I took a little two-year hiatus to run down to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and go to work with some other people. They gave me a company car, being unfamiliar with my driving record up to that point. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, uh, over at some guy's house one night, we, we, were, uh, you know, we were drinking pretty hard, watching Monday Night Football and, and, uh, and accessorizing that with a number of other things. And, and I took off out of there, and I was driving. I used to say I was driving way too fast on this residential street to navigate this turn. And, and I don't know if I was driving too fast or not. All I know now is I couldn't navigate the turn at any speed, apparently. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I hit this tree, and I hit it really hard. It, it, it ended up totaling the car. Uh, uh, the front windshield and back windshield were knocked out. It caved in the passenger side. It was a real mess. And, uh, uh, but, but I was so afraid uh, that for the police to come and get another DUI and lose this job and all these things that, that I, I saw, you know, I, I, amazingly the car would drive. You know, I, I backed it up a little bit. <laughs> And, and I, I started, I said, well, I got to get back over to these guys' house, you know, where I, where, and, and, and the car's just driving almost sideways. The frame's bent so badly. Glass is kind of blowing in on me, and, and I'm just, God, just please let me get over there, you know. And, and so uh, we can put together a plan. And uh, uh, <laughs> so I got over there, and as I say, you know, Larry Curley and Mo began working on this plan. And... As it turns out, our plan was that we'd drink a couple of cups of coffee. These guys, you know, that would render us sober. These guys would get uh, back in the car with me. We would drive back over and drive back into the tree. And, uh, uh, and well, uh, you, you got to stay with me a minute now. And uh, uh, this was a well-crafted plan. And, and uh, so we we ease up in you know ease up in there to to the tree and and uh, uh, I get out to go to the house at the corner lot you know no cell phones or anything then I'm going to the house at the corner lot to call the police to report police will come my two buddies will substantiate my story that we were run off the road by a white Ford pickup truck that caused this crime and we do it. So I'm walking up to the house, and this guy comes flying out the side door of his house down to where we are. He's, he's running. His eyes are just big as saucers. He goes, are you okay? Are you guys okay? I said, yeah, man, we're okay. And he said, was well, the damnedest thing. You're the second guy to hit that tree tonight. <laughs> uh, I said, yeah. I said, you know, y'all ought to cut that damn tree down because it's... it's it's poorly placed, obviously, and, uh, uh, and a hazard. But, but now that's what happened there. And you know what? I didn't, the next day, the next day, I didn't look back on that. At, you know, what I looked back on is I whew, worked out, got away, you know. <laughs> Told the men I worked for what happened. Insurance pays for everything. Whew, skated, no problem, All right? No big deal. About two years later, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I'd run back home because, kind of like other people talked this weekend, I had this job. I just didn't work at this job down here in Florida for a couple of years, and they finally find decided that this is not working. You know, uh, uh, when you, as a salesman, sooner or later they begin to notice if nothing gets sold. And uh, uh, so I, I ran back home with my tail between my legs. But this time, working in Atlanta, uh, I left the TGI Fridays one night. I'd been there. I've been there since afternoon, but I, this is about seven or eight at night that I finally left there. I'd been drinking kamikaze shooters and taking two and alls all afternoon, you know, recreationally. And uh, uh, I, I left there, and I was so disoriented that uh, that I got on the interstate going going the wrong direction. I two eighty five the perimeter. I, I got on uh, going east in the in the westbound lane, and I hit a car head on, and uh, two other cars hit us, and it towed all four cars and. And uh, I came to in the Fulton County Jail the next morning, and I'd, I'd urinated on myself, and I had thrown up on myself. Or, you know, as I say, I, I hope I did, because somebody did. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and, 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 you know, that, that can happen in the drunk tank if you go down, but uh, 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 it's an indignity I would prefer to have inflicted on myself. So, uh, 
so that's the story I'm going with. And, uh, um, uh, but I will tell you in, in, in all earnestness that, that that morning there was no got away with it. There was, I, I, was, I was ashamed of what I had done. I was as ashamed as I had ever been of what I had done. I was a, as afraid as I had ever been of the circumstances and the consequences that I believed awaited me as a result of that. I didn't, I didn't yet know what the, the nature of uh, other people's injuries might be. Uh, I was uh, as humiliated as I had ever been at the state that I found myself in. And I was as certain as I had ever been that I'll never drink again. And about 10 days later, I'm driving down the road in a different car, drinking a bottle of wine, smoking a joint, thinking, you know, I nearly overreacted to that. <laughs> and that's, that's the alcoholism that I find. You know, I, I, I love our literature. And, and, and as, as Bob was saying last night, I know that ownership of a big book and reading a big book does not provide my recovery. But, but I will tell you what I did find in that book. What I found is that the big book for me, because I, nobody talked to me about alcoholism before I got here, so that big book is where I found myself. That I truly was able to identify with my alcoholism through the pages of that book. And early on, the big book validated my alcoholism. And I hope, I hope that today, the way I live my life and the experience of my life validates the, the recovery that's discussed in the big book. Because it, think, the things that have happened for me, the book says will happen. The pitfalls that await me have, have, have been there. The lack of vigilance and diligence, that daily reprieve can slip away from me at any time. Not on a drink, but on my character defects or my behavior, anything. I, as I say, I'm, I, I can do anything I've ever done I'm capable of doing again, and uh, and sometimes it pops out, but uh, but that's how my drinking was when I when I came out of that treatment center in uh, uh, in 1989. You know, the first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting I went to, or that I was a part of, was the uh, second night I was there. Two men came in from AA, and the experience that I had was I I, I know I heard someone else talk about it this weekend. It might even have been at the old timers meeting, but. Uh, 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 these men came in and they were carrying, a lot of people here have this, those fancy uh, 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 leather bound big books, you know, you got your, well, and those weren't quite as prominent then, but, but, you know, I knew nothing about nothing. I'm there day, day one, but they had given me a big book when I, you know, checked in uh, with my pillow and my blanket and, and uh, uh, a $13,000 big book, soft cover, and uh, 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 these guys came in that night and they had, they had those fancy leather binders with all the embroidery and their initials on it and AA on it. And uh, I thought, my God, I said, AA's got an arts and crafts class. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be making lanyards and, and moccasins and stuff before this thing is over. But those guys came in that night and they did what I have since come to know our book encourages them to do and encourages me to do. It says they, they arrived as ex-problem drinkers properly armed with the facts about themselves. And that's what I could hear, that they talked about themselves. I'd, I'd just spent my first day in treatment where I, I, again, this is where I'm not sure the difference between what I think happened and what really happened. But my memory is they spent all day trying to convince me I was an alcoholic, trying to tell me what was wrong with me, trying to prove by my experience my alcoholism asking me those questions and saying, see, you must be. These guys didn't ask me a thing about me. They shared about their experience. So now I'm not worried about answering those essay questions. I'm not trying to defend myself. I don't have to explain myself to anybody. They have my rapt attention because, because there's not a test at the end of the class. Nothing's going to happen. They're just sharing about themselves. And what I believe happened was there was a little internal shift. And it wasn't an intellectual thing that happened. I didn't get a piece of information that changed anything for me, to the best of my recollection. But I was able to listen in such a way. So what I know now is that they were speaking the language of the heart. And where it touched me was in the heart, not in the head. That it came in through a different spot because they had a message of weight and depth that Alcoholics Anonymous has. 
And with a real alcoholic, that message resonates, particularly when they are telling the truth about themselves. Well, if I stand up here, if I start veering off and telling you a story that is not true, my guess is you, will, you might not think it's, well, that's not true, but somehow there'll be a disconnect. Somehow there's a disconnect because the truth seems to resonate here, and the BS goes out the door. That's when, that's when you start looking at your watch and saying, let's go, you know? Not you, sir. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the fact is, those, those, are, those are the things that began to happen for me. I got out of there after 30 days and I went down to uh, uh, the 202 Club uh, uh, in Nashville, the Friendship House, and I walked upstairs and I think uh, 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 it was fortuitous that I could turn to my left or turn to my right to go to meetings that are going on at, at the same time. And, and I walked into a little room in the left where they were having a, uh, a, a book study, a literature study. And the people in there changed my life. Because they were sharing, you know, I got to tell you just for me, that if I wandered into an open discussion meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous as my first meeting, man, I'd have been home, you know? I'd have been home because I couldn't wait to like what I, hear what I've got to say in one, you know? I, that's that's the, my main reason for going to an open discussion meeting, to figure out what I'm going to tell them. In that meeting, if you're in the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous, no matter what I say or somebody else says, that the next person is going to bring it back to the recovery that's in the book. And those people had a reverence. They had a reverence for the literature. And again, as Bob said, not, 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 a, not as a doctor and not as a beat me over the head with it. What they had was a respect for it. They had a respect for the message that's in there. And they had a respect for protecting the integrity of that message. And, and I found my sponsor, Frank, in there. And uh, uh, Frank was my sponsor for, uh, uh, for the first year that I was there in Nashville. And in 1990, at just over a year sober, uh, I'm moving to Richmond, Virginia. Now, I'll tell you, before I left, I'm, I'm a few months sober. Well, I'm, I'm about three months sober, and I went to Las Vegas uh, on business. And I, for the first 15 years, 14 years of my recovery, I went to Las Vegas two, three, four times a year for business. But I've also got a really bad gambling problem. And, Bob and I talked a while, but the difference in our gambling problems is, is my, my, my problem with gambling, his problem, I think he indicated, was that, that it became, uh, uh, it, he spent so much time and committed so much to it, and, and, and it took him off here. My problem with gambling, I'm so bad at it, I can't afford to do it the way that I do it. <laughs> and so when I lose money like that, it makes me a liar, a cheat, and a thief. And, uh, 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 and, and so it makes me act contrary to the principles that you're asking me to live by. It's nothing inherently wrong with gambling. I mean, I don't have an opinion. I just know it's not good for me. But, uh, but I went out and gambled, lost a lot of money, and, and a lot of money, it's all relative, but a lot of money is more than you've got, and that's how much I lost. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and, and I came home, and, and this had been a big deal with my wife and I, uh, uh, and I you know, was, was supposed to be not gambling by now, and I'd made that, I'd signed some pledge, and you know, uh, uh, I went to Frank and I said, do I have to, you know, do I have to tell Connie? It's another place where, where my memory and, and his recollection are different. I, I thought, you know, so I said, I don't know what he said. I don't know what I heard. And I thought it was no. And uh, uh, I was willing to go with that, you know. And, uh, uh, but what he, said, I, what he said was, he said, Steve, he, he, he says, I think you should. He says, I think that, 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 that the principles that we're trying to look at here and you're trying to live by would, would, would suggest that you do so. But what he did say was, if you don't do it, don't leave. He said, I'm not kicking you out of the club because you don't do it, because I hope if you stay around here, then what will become evident, what you need to do will, will come to you over time. See, we don't kick people out of AA because they're not well yet. You let me get better here. You allow me to show up as I am and, and give me the room to grow, sometimes at a much slower pace than those around me. And, uh, uh, and, and I'm so grateful for that. I moved to Richmond, so I didn't tell Connie, by the way. I got a secret little, you know, mailbox to, to handle the uh, uh, correspondence. All of this stuff. Got in the, borrowed the money at the bank. Did all the stuff we do. You know, all this secret. And I, but I go to Richmond. I'm over there, and, uh, and I got a sponsor uh, 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 named Joe over there. And Joe's just been, uh, uh, you know, he's been a godsend for me because what Joe offers me, I think, more than anything else is perspective. Uh, the truth. He said, Steve, he says, I think one of the main things I've got to offer you, other than as we went through these steps together, is the truth. So you, he said, you're a grown man, you're going to do what you're going to do. He says, I just want you doing it knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it so you don't kid yourself about it. 
And uh, back in the, in the story Freedom from Bondage, uh, she talks about the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, rationalization is trying to give a socially acceptable explanation for socially unacceptable behavior. And I see so much of my life I've spent like that. It can happen any moment today, too, that I will do something and then try to find an explanation that's sufficient to, to satisfy you for my behavior, which is socially unacceptable. In this case, uh, um, Joe, I asked Joe if he would be my sponsor about the second meeting over there, and he said, he said sure. He said, let's talk about it, and we did. And, and he began taking me through the steps. Uh, 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 Frank and I, you know, he'd, I'd really only, only done through the fifth step, and I'd really only done that. Uh, I didn't know how bad I'd done it until I got a little better at doing it, you know, and, and frankly, a few years from now, I won't know how bad I'm doing now until I look back and see me. So uh, uh, I'm prepared for that to happen. But, but Joe, Joe said, Steve, one of the, we were talking about in how it works, it says some of us tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil till we let go absolutely. And it, that, that line always bothered me. And I said, Joe, I, you know, I, I got some good ideas. I, I showed up here with some good ideas. I said, that seems to imply that all my ideas are bad ideas, the ones that I showed up here with. He said, no, 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 Steve. He said, uh, he said you have some good ideas. He says, but your problem is you can't tell the good ones from the bad ones. <laughs> and that's the truth. And that I couldn't, I had no powers of discernment. And so he said, so let's talk about your good ideas. And that's what I meant when I said I call him when I think I've got a really good idea, I run it by him so he can help me see what perhaps I haven't seen from a little different angle. Uh, I finally sat down after about two and a half years. I got some money. I was going to be able to pay off that debt. And, uh, uh, and I asked Joe if uh, uh, I had not told him about it. So I sat down. I'm going to explain to him now I can do it, but I'm also going to explain to him why it's probably not necessary that I talk to Connie about it. <laughs> uh, Connie had made it clear, clear, unequivocal, that she was going to leave me if I gambled again, that we were done. And uh, uh, so I'm going to be able to pay it. She doesn't have to know. I, you know. Two and a half years sober. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to, you know, she shouldn't have to feel this fear. I, I haven't gambled anymore since that time. All of these things. I said, Joe, you know, what do you think? And he said, I think you're a coward. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he actually used another word. He said, I think you're a chicken. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, he said, but the thing is, see, he said, the thing is, Steve, I believe you believe everything you just said. And he said, and I believe most of it is true. He says, I know you don't want to hurt her. I know that you don't want to shake that marriage and that trust, that you're now trying to be a trustworthy guy. He said, but the fact is that you're afraid to live with the consequences of the truth. And at Alcoholics Anonymous, you have asked me to be willing to live with the consequences of the truth. That that is how I turn my will and my life over to the care of God. That I do things that don't look like they're in my best interest. That I take a leap of faith that I'm afraid won't work out my way. It is easy for me to be noble when I think, I, in fact, as the book says, I think I, I, just, I just want as much character as will get me by, you know. I just want to be a good enough guy that you think I'm a good guy and don't know the real truth, you know. But he exposed that for me, and I'm so grateful. And I went home, and I, and I told her, and it wasn't a pleasant experience, but we are celebrating 23 years married now. And, that, that, and I gambled twice after that. Uh, less money, and I didn't wait as long to tell her each time. And that's what he said. <laughs> he said I said, I can't tell her. And he said, oh, she thinks she's going to be so impressed that you're telling her so quickly this time. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and I said, I'm not sure impressed was the word, but she did stay. And, uh, and uh, those types of things. I'll tell you that in 19, uh, um, you know, the things that, that were brought up through the talk last night that brought things up in me, and, 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 and uh, uh, in 1996, I made more money that year than I had ever made before again, and a lot of money is just more than you've ever had, right? It's all relative, and, and I'd made more money than I'd ever made, and, and uh, uh, at the end of 1996, in fact, I went out, I bought some exercise equipment. I bought a treadmill and what we refer to at the house as the Parabody EX350. And uh, uh, these things collectively cost about $7,000 at the time. And I could sell them to you today in like new condition, but uh, 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 but I was sitting down telling Joe about this one day, you know, when after because I'm, I'm spending stuff, I'm buying stuff, and, and, and he, you know, he's just kind of, 
you know, shaking his head that, that I'm spending this money like this because he, he knows that historically I don't do that well and handle money well. And, and then I called him a few months later and I said, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I said, I'm making this money like I've never made. And I said, I'm scared to death that if it stops, I won't be able to, I, you know, I won't be able to go back. And he said, Steve, the thing about this money, he says, is you're going to either learn that you're ready for it or learn that you're not ready for it. And he said, by the way, one lesson is no, or le no more or less valuable than the other. And uh, a few months later, I got to call him and say, well, the jury's in. I wasn't ready. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and I came out of 1996 in more debt than I'd ever been in in my life. Now, these are decisions based on self, which later put me in a position to be hurt. Okay, it took me till 1999 after Connie and I moved back to Nashville to go bankrupt. Uh, I had done a financial inventory, by the way, in that time, looked at my money, I wrote it out, I did it, I put it in my book, and I didn't take it to my sponsor because I discovered things about me in that inventory that I wasn't ready to change. And if I show it to him, he's going to ask me to do something that I don't want to do. So I tucked it away, and two years later, you know, the judge did it for me. You know? <laughs> And you're bankrupt. And, but I spent a full year, year, year and a half answering the phone every night, talking to creditors, telling them they were right. I owe you money. It's your money. It's not my money. You're right. I don't have it. I can't do it. Now, I will tell you, one of the old ideas Joe said I needed to give up was the idea that I think I know what just happened. Because <laughs> he said it. You know what? It's going to look like one thing, it's going to come, but it's going to be another. And, and this was again brought up last night that uh, uh, I'll tell you what happened. I was in a pretty good marriage. Loved my wife. She loved me. Things were going along okay. But man, that money, a little pressure, a little pressure of getting a household when that money gets tight. And uh, uh, we started blaming each other for stuff, and we started arguing a little bit. And we had a terrible argument one night. And then we made a decision the next day that we weren't going to do that that this is going to be hard, but we're going to, she had a lot more to forgive of me than I did of her. But she said she, would, she was going to not blame me, and then we were going to go through this together as partners. Because we can do that, but I can't, I, I can't hold them off and, 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 and us have this thing going too. So i tell you what, see, I thought I was going bankrupt. It totally redefined my relationship with my wife. Totally. Now, I don't have the wisdom or the courage to volunteer for that up front. But as Bob said, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't think I've got the wisdom or the courage to volunteer next time. So I don't know what's coming. But I know looking back that that absolutely, I thought I was going bankrupt when in fact I was undergoing relationship counseling. <laughs> and, uh, had no idea. We came out of that and uh, uh, and I'm just telling you that, that, that I got a marriage that I, that I wouldn't trade today. And, and uh, you know, she came home one night after being, uh, uh, going to one of her meetings and out with some ladies. And, and I was just sitting home watching TV. And she came and she says, you know what? She says, I really love you. She said, because I've just been out with these ladies. And this particular group, at least on this particular night, you know, were, were, were complaining, were if he's going there and having a good time, you know, you know how it was, you, you, if you're married to somebody, it's not fair for them to have fun without you, right? <laughs> There's some kind of rule that you can't enjoy yourself if I'm not there, and if I'm there, it's, you know, given you're not going to enjoy yourself. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and and what, what we're so grateful for today is the compatibility in our relationship, and it doesn't mean we see things the same way. We are really different people but we have a mutual respect that allows those differences and celebrates them rather than as we used to do was, was pick at them. And man, that's just a comfort to know that she knows I'm here, she hopes I have a great time, and she's glad she's not here. And we're both comfortable with that. You know, that's terrific. I want to spend the last couple of minutes telling you about how I established a relationship or where I am today with the relationship of the God of my understanding. Because that's one of the things the book says that we do in our personal stories is we talk about how we establish a relationship with God. And this is what I'll close with, that uh, uh, yeah, I was in that treatment center, and I went in, and I kind of got hung up, you know, hung up on this treatment center, second step, here I am, I don't know what to do, I don't know what I believe in, I don't think I'm atheist, I don't know if I'm agnostic, I, as I often said, I think I'm just apathetic, you know, I just had no, I, I just spent no time giving any thought to any, anything like that. 
And uh, 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 when they would circle up and say the Lord's Prayer like we will after this meeting, I would step back from the circle and I would put my hands behind my back and stare at the ceiling and, and not uh, participate in the prayer. And finally this guy asked me, uh, one, of the, one of the guys there after you know three or four days uh, of, of watching this, about two or three weeks into the treatment, he said, Steve, what's that all about? You know, what are you doing, man? And, and I'm serious. You know, I mean, this wasn't like being flip. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm figuring stuff out in my own head. And I, I said, you know, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. This doesn't feel right to me, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. And, you know, that old AA laugh, he, you know, he says, Steve, he says, pal, I got some good news for you and some bad news. <laughs> I said, what's the bad news? You know, I'll play. I know I'm being condescended to, you know. And uh, I said, I'll play. He says, well, the bad news is, is that hypocrisy is way down your list of problems. <laughs> he said, and you might want to address them in the order in which they will kill your ass. <laughs> I said, well, Mike, Mike, what's the good news? He said, the good news is there's room for another hypocrite in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I, I will tell you that I am as grateful for that today as I was that morning, okay? Because we are a room full of people who are committed to a set of perfect ideals, and we are told in how it works that I'm going to come nowhere near perfect adherence to them. I am, I am told in the 12 and 12 that I want to aim for perfection and settle for patient improvement. So I don't know, I may look hypocritical to someone from the outside looking in because I aspire to and I speak to these perfect ideals and I fall so short of them on a regular basis. But, uh, but I think that I'm moving, the graph isn't even clearly straight up. It, it, it zigs and zags, but over time I hope I, I'm, I'm continuing to get a little, little higher on the graph. Uh, further on, I was finally able then to grab hold of that and just be a member of AA, you know, kind of do things that you guys were doing. But where I found the relationship with the God of my understanding and, and, and how I can relate to that, because how I relate myself to God is exactly, uh, it, it depends on how I relate myself to you, I believe. These, these two things are, are, are intertwined. And what was read today is that the, uh, no one can fully define or comprehend that power which is God. It's what our book says, so I've given up trying to define or comprehend that power, you know. As I said, freed up a lot of time for me. I've quit <laughs> worrying about that. So I don't have to define it or comprehend it. It goes on to say that deep within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It says, in fact, in the end, it is only there that the great reality may be found. In the final analysis, it is only there. So now, that's my last analysis. I've decided God is deep within me. It's okay if you've got a different field. This is, this is just what I'm grabbing hold of. And then it says, however, it may be obscured by pomp, by worship of other things, and by calamity. So God's here, but he get, I get blocked off. You know, from the neck down, I get lost sometimes because I get blocked off by that, by that pomp, the reemergence of self, the pride, the ego. Uh, by worship of other things, any of those things that I said above that relationship, money, phrases, how much you like me or don't like me, or any of those things that become, have an exaggerated importance in my life, become the altar that I'm worshiping at. And calamity, quite frankly, can be something very real like death or sickness, or it can be the, the cable going out at my house, you know, during the, <laughs> when the big game's on. Because a calamity is anything that I've decided cannot be happening to me. <laughs> and that's very real. So over time, there are less things. I, I am more and more willing to allow things to happen to me. What the steps do, is, as Bob alluded to it last night, it's, it's, it, I'm clearing stuff away. I'm not finding something that wasn't here. I, I'm allowing the authentic me to find its way out. I'm getting rid of those things, hopefully, that are blocking me off. And the thing is, they reattach themselves when I'm not looking, when I'm not vigilant. It goes on to say that as I, that as I, I uh, uh, draw nearer to him, he will disclose himself to me. Well, I believe the way I draw nearer to God is to draw nearer to you. Alcoholics Anonymous has offered me that opportunity. I'll close my friend of mine, Mo Holleran in Nashville. Uh, uh, Mo passed away now two and a half years ago. And he used to always recite the verse to a poem whenever he, whenever he talked, and often even when he just shared in a meeting. 
And the first time I heard it over almost nine years ago now when Mo did it, I, it, it, I said that captures exactly what my experience has been in Alcoholics Anonymous, what my feeling is around this. And uh, Mo got uh, diagnosed with cancer and, and uh, it was my friend Jerry and I went over to have breakfast with him one morning in late October and he ended up passing away in, uh, 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 in December. And when we were having breakfast, uh, I, I asked Mo, I said, Mo, would you mind if, uh, uh, when I have a chance to give a talk, that I recite that poem? I said, because it will help me remember you and honor you, and it's meant so much to me, and it'll be a way to pass on what you've given to me. And, and he was, a, he, you know, Mo is just a, he's that guy that loved drunks, dry ones or wet ones, you know. He's that guy that, that when, the, when the perennial slipper would come back in the room and, and I'm going, oh man, I hope he doesn't come over here, you know. I'm looking down, pretending to be busy. Mo's running to him, you know, so glad you're back here. Man, we love you, we're glad you're back. Mo's the kind of man that makes me want to be a better man, just by watching. And he was a little embarrassed, he said, oh Steve, he says, if you think it'll help another drunk, because that's all he cared about. So a little verse goes, you know, I sought my God, my God I could not see. I sought my soul, my soul eluded me. But I sought my fellow man and found all three. And that's been my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, that you give me a chance through seeking my fellow man, through that joyous intimacy with friends. Intimacy is what we have here. We don't have, we don't have these, you know, passing relationships, you know. I'm amazed I go meet a guy for bagel and coffee in the morning, you know, and within two minutes we're, we are talking about stuff, man. We are, we are into it. And that's maybe not that other people aren't willing to do that. I never gave other people a chance to do that with me. But uh, uh, you are the people that have allowed me to find both my God and my soul and my purpose. Thank you so much for having me here this week.